Hello, I'm Cara Bell Russell with today's installment of Courtly Love and the Cult of the Virgin. Yesterday we spoke of Catharism, one of the heretical offshoots of Christianity spreading through Europe in these years of 1000 to 1200, and the life of one of its major proponents, Eleanor of Aquitaine. Catharism was one of several heretical sects spreading during this time, another main one being Waldensianism. Both of them spliced together Catholic beliefs with combinations of folk belief and beliefs that were self-serving, an example being the leadership of women in Catharism being an important factor for an intelligent, educated, powerful, privileged woman like Eleanor. As we entered the year 1000, these heretical sects began with just isolated teachers and leaders in small areas. By the year 1100, these leaders had begun to travel to spread their beliefs, and by 1200, there were large communities of faith that were rivaling the established church in some regions. Meanwhile, the church and its Benedictine monasteries were dealing with their own lapses, while also to a lesser extent combating the heresies seeping into regional church teachings. One of my primary sources for this series has been the Great Courses series, The High Middle Ages, of Dr. Philip Daylater of the College of William and Mary. And for those who are interested, you can find a listing of the main resources as well as a wealth of minor resources used to research this series on our classical blog on our website, delmarvapublicradio.net. Professor Daylater identifies a trend in monasteries throughout the early High and Late Middle Ages. That trend is an inception of strong faith, strong rules, and devout adherence, followed by growth of the order through the addition of devout followers, and then politically expedient followers, unwanted children, the elderly, and sons who don't inherit property. With these less devout followers comes the gifts of land and money for their upkeep, and with the growth of wealth came the distractions of running a lucrative order and eventually the laxity of even the devout followers in following the rule. Last week I mentioned there were early, fairly ineffective, somewhat gentler versions of the Inquisitions during this time. The really severe Inquisitions that we think of today came closer to 1300. Basically, the local clerics were tasked with finding and rooting out heresies in their area and correcting the spiritual lives of their flock, mostly through instruction. Concurrently and notably, in the late 900s, we have internal church reform going on. The Cluniac Reform, which was to bring the monasteries and priests back to the rule and a more austere, ascetic way of being in the world. For just one example, it was fairly common for priests to be married in the 900s, despite their vow of celibacy. The Cluniac Reform, and about 200 later, the Cistercian Reforms, underwent these previously mentioned patterns. Sincere, severe devotion, loosening to prosperity and laxity, and the deterioration of these reforms set the stage for the Franciscan movement in the early 1200s. And to be fair, it is worth noting that the rise of the heretical sects and beliefs were not beliefs altered for ease, but a devout desire to return to a more strict faith that many thought to be increasingly lacking in the Mother Church. To all of this background, inside and outside the Church, we turn our attention to the court chaplains. Chaplains who, by their very position within the castle, have a very difficult time maintaining their devotional duties and lifestyle. By the very nature of their indebtedness to the court, court chaplains had to be at least thoughtful, reserved, and diplomatic, and at most, they needed to be politically savvy. Given the judicial and preeminent leadership of the castellan lord and lady at court, it is easy to see how very difficult it might be to pronounce negative judgment on the daily lives of the two most powerful people in your world. Given the wealth and relative security of court, the higher position of the clergy, and the temptations of court life, we see these court chaplains as those who would have a mistress or a wife, and to be more easily influenced to lean in the direction of heretical additions in both small and increasing ways. These court clerics would have been on the front lines of social trends and changes in the most influential circles. 
they would have been the first to see the ineffective folly of the early Latin courtesy books, and they doubtlessly would have been asked to grant pardons against the peace and truce of God treaties. And, as we'll hear tomorrow, it was a court chaplain who codified these ideas after they had already taken hold in the medieval zeitgeist. <laughs>